Ladies and gentlemen, the next session is SMW Conversation, the way ahead, building up capabilities and technologies in decarbonization solution. The session will be using the online interactive Q&A to post your questions and comments. Hopefully, the uh, moderator will have some time for pigeonhole to, to answer your questions and you can also vote for your favorite questions on pigeonhole as well. So ladies and gentlemen, it's after lunch, so I'll need your help to show some support to our panelists. Let's please welcome your session moderator. Let's welcome Jan Paul De Wilder, Head Decarbonization, Energy Transition and Innovation, Rina. Welcome, sir. Thank you for your applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We have a very interesting mix today. We've got uh, quite a few online and we have a few uh, in person as well. Joining us online, joining Jan Paul on the panel are Rasmus Bach Nielsen, Global Head Fuel Decarbonization Trafigura. He'll be joining us online. I'm not sure whether he's already on. Joining us in person. Oh, okay, it looks like we're all there, huh? Wonderful. Joining us in person, let's welcome Bo Sirap Simonson, CEO Maersk McKinney Moller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Let's welcome Bo, please. Welcome. I believe our friends online can hear us as well. And then we have Yanis L. Elfgen, Head of Portfolio Management, Port Estate and Maritime Affairs, Hamburg Port Authority. Let's give a big hand to Yanis, please. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have joining us online, Dr. Tillo Dukat, Vice President, Fleet Performance Management, Storm Joe. Let's give him a big hand to welcome him. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And last but not least, Bernard Liu, Senior General Manager, Executive Office KSL Maritime. Bernard will be joining us in person, I believe. Let's welcome Bernard, please. Thank you. All right. And I will now hand over the time to our panel. Thank you very much. Let's give our panel a big round of applause, please. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will start this panel discussion with a, a short backdrop uh, on the goals that are driving uh, maritime decarbonization before uh, further introducing the, uh, the panelists to you. The slide will probably pop up uh, quite soon. Um, in 2015, uh, member countries of the United Nations made commitments to fight climate change, which resulted in the, uh, in the Paris Agreement, essentially to limit uh, global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. Uh, at the time, international shipping um, was not included in that agreement, although international shipping carries about 80% of the global trade and is responsible for 2 to 3% of uh, global carbon emissions. IMO, however, has uh, taken action to commit the maritime industry to a reduction of emissions by implementing its uh, initial strategy on the reduction of greenhouse gases from ships. Um, hopefully, the slide will pop up soon, but there will be a chart uh, which shows that the business as usual scenario would result in catastrophic escalation from uh, emissions from ships. IMO has uh, realized that it's ambitious uh, cannot be achieved in one step or with just one measure and defined short-term measures by 2023, medium-term measures by 2030 and long-term measures by 2050, as have already been highlighted by a number of presenters before. Um, what not, has not been mentioned is that IMO ultimate goal is zero emissions from international shipping before the end of this century. Now, it is widely acknowledged that um, short-term goals may be achieved by technical and operational measures alone, but meeting the medium and the long-term goals heavily depends on further technical innovations, market-based measures, and the effective uptake of uh, alternative low-carbon and eventually zero-carbon fuels. Um, it should be noted, however, that the greenhouse gas strategy of IMO will be reviewed in 2023 and the effectiveness of short-term measures will be reviewed in 2026. And it is generally expected that these will be further tightened going forward. Uh, in fact, during the recent MEPC, meet, MEPC meeting in November last year, a number of member states have actually submitted proposals to further strengthen IMO's 2030 and uh, 2050 ambition levels. 
Uh, moreover, during COP26 last year in Glasgow, there have been calls for zero emissions of shipping already by 2050 to stay on course to meet the Paris Agreement uh, objectives. Now, noting that uh, decarbonisation challenges are monumental, and, and not only for the shipping industry, um, I will now introduce the panelists uh, coming from a wide spectrum of the, uh, the maritime industry and look forward to a fruitful discussion and, and in insights from them. Uh, on stage, we have Mr. Bernard Liu, uh, who is the Senior General Manager in the Executive Office at uh, Koch Singapore Limited. Uh, Bernard supports KSL sustainability efforts and leads KSL Maritime Ventures, which invests into maritime tech uh, related technologies and enhances KSL's ability to deliver additional value to our customers. With me on stage as well, he has been introduced uh, three times now during this event, so <laughs> I will just mention that you are the CEO of the Mers McKinney Mulder Center for Zero Shipping since its inception in, uh, in 2020. Um, behind me, um, we start with uh, Janus Elfgen, who is the head of portfolio management and is responsible for ensuring the commercial viability and the sustainability and innovative development of the port estate uh, assets of the Hamburg Port Authority. Within HPA, Mr. Elfgen is heading the task force hydrogen import terminal, and he is a member of the Junior Chamber International and young leader in the German Asia Pacific Business Association. Uh, next is uh, Rasmus Bak Nielsen, uh, who is the global head of fuel decarbonization uh, at Travigura, as well as board member of H2 Energy and Everson eFuels. Notably, uh, in 2020, Rasmus was co author and uh, originator of Travigura's groundbreaking IMO led shipping decarbonization proposal, and he was identified by Lloyd's List as the 10th most influential shipping person in the world. Um, Last but not least, uh, on, the, on the far right here, Tilo Dukert. Dr. Tilo Dukert is uh, leading Storm Geo's fleet performance management business as vice president since 2019. Um, Tilo holds a degree in mechanical engineering and has uh, a PhD in, in business administration. Um, now, without further ado, let's go to the, the discussion and, and the questions. And I would like to start with uh, a, a matter which is related to the short-term measures uh, of IMO, which are already kicking in in, in, in 2023. Um, the CII, or Carbon Intensity Indicator, is, is one of those uh, of IMO short-term uh, operational measures. Um, and I would like to ask Tilo, uh, which role digital tools can play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from shipping uh, operations and, and thereby improving the, the CII ratings? Yes, thanks for the question. Um, obviously, I mean, we have uh, several measures which can help uh, to improve the CII. There's on the one hand the hardware-based uh, measures, but we are talking about software, uh, obviously, more today. Uh, and if you look about uh, at software, then there are several tools which can help to reduce and to manage your CII um, because you have to go from A to B in the most efficient way. Um, so there's, for example, weather routing, which is a, a very good tool um, to reduce the carbon emissions on your route because you can uh, choose the exact best route to come from A to B. So that will, uh, in the long term, reduce carbon emissions. And there's also other digital tools like uh, the monitoring of your uh, vessel performance and all the systems on board of the vessel, which can in the long end reduce your carbon emissions. So these are very practical measures um, to cope with the challenge we are looking at right now. Right, thank you, thank you, Tilo. Um, Bernard, if I may go to you. Uh, um, uh, KSL is a company that is both a ship owner and, and a shipyard operator. Uh, could you perhaps share KSL's maritime uh, perspective on decarbonization and, and the risk appetite um, to adopt early stage uh, decarbonization technologies? Thank you, John Paul. Afternoon, everyone. Um, may let me do some quick introduction of KSL Maritime Group. We own and operate 140, over 140 different marine assets and five shipyards. We have Pacific Carriers Limited, Porsche Offshore Services, and Pax Ocean Shipyards. And finally, we have recently also started our own KSL Maritime Ventures. So these are the four companies that form the group. And how we approach carbon decarbonization in this case is more of a total sum game. In the past five years, we have been looking to scope one, two, and three in terms of carbon emissions reductions. For scope one, 
we look at our existing assets and vessels. One, of course, is to look into carbon capture, which is the holy grail that everybody's speaking about. We have initiated research and development programs with the local institutes and ASTAR and other engagement companies. So that is on carbon capture. Next, we look into our supply chain with respect to scope two. Our seafarers, when they travel, airfare, right, air miles and travel like that, how do we reduce that? How do we make it more efficient? Our supply chain with respect to ship spares, regional distribution of equipment, how can we also optimize that piece of work? So technologies comes into play here with respect to AI, predictive maintenance, fleet management systems. And that's how we also adopt different technologies besides hardware. Of course, then we talk about scope three, and that is our ultimate supply chain, our vendors. Recently, collectively as well, with the Coastal Sustainability Alliance, we're now looking into electrifying and decarbonizing the coastal logistics supply chain. So that forms a more holistic approach to how we adopt new technologies and also support the ecosystem at large. Now, to do this, our shipyards play a meaningful role as well. We all know that you know, conventional fuels, including transition fuels, have at least another two decades to move onwards. How then do we ensure that our current assets are maintained well? The ships are coming to play. How then do we prepare for retrofitting? The yards comes in as well. And that is how we have also initiated our own center of excellence in engineering R&D to support this transition from the assets from conventional fuels into new fuels. Uh, well, Bernard, in, in, in the, in the run-up to this panel, we, we, um, we talked about Singapore's Coastal Sustainability Alliance, um, basically to give this, uh, this panel a bit of a, uh, a local, local twist. Um, now, although domestic shipping is, is not subjected to IMO regulations, um, uh, it is important to mention that, that uh, Singapore locally is, is actively accelerating decarbonization uh, on a local level. Could you perhaps briefly elaborate on, uh, on this, this uh, initiative? Sure. I'm going to start with a um, physical example and call a friend here, but effectively we are very blessed to be in Singapore because we have a very strong infrastructure in play. We have a strong maritime cluster over in Singapore as one of the leading maritime capitals. And one of the playbooks that you have here, right, sorry to do a pitch for MPA in a way, but you have a maritime blueprint. So that provides us I think it's also a framework for a lot of communities, a lot of companies to come together to communicate and discuss. How then do we talk about collaboration, not as a buzzword, but action word. So the Coastal Sustainability Alliance was exactly that. If you look into the blueprint, you will see the decarbonization pathways for assets. But assets alone and managing assets alone do not help to do full decarbonization. You need the collaboration and the ecosystem to be formed. And so what we tried to do, again, starting off with shipyard, is to design a new PXO series of vessels that is electrified, but yet future ready for any future fuels. That supports our R&D and the production line and supply chain for the local SMEs in Singapore. Now, 99% of Singapore organizations and companies are SMEs. So if you don't have them on board, your scope one and three supply or decarbonization plan will be affected. So having the support of the SMEs allows us to move on to the third phase, which is engaging on future talent. Shipping needs more talent, be it on crew. We are seeing effects of crew side, right? Shortage of crew. COVID has also caused some disturbances there. Back on shore, same. We need to be able to attract talent. And the way to do so is to create new technologies, create new drives for people to want to join us and see a future. Now, with that, we move to the logistics supply and standardization of infrastructure. So any vessels coming to Singapore know that you do not have a discrepancy and you're able to operate smoothly and seamlessly. So that's how we collaborate collectively as a group. And finally, with that logistics platform that is formed, we allow for a hot bait of new startups to come in again because we can attract new startups with new problem statements and they know they have meaningful use cases to work upon. Their success is increased. So that's how we actually engage. And of course, all this cannot be done without the support of MPA, IMDA, Singapore Shipping Association. There's so many infrastructure play organizations in Singapore that are coming together to collaborate and to help see companies succeed. 
Thank you, Bernard. It, it's, uh, it's good to note that such initiatives are taken uh, on, a, on, a, on a national level. Um, now, let me engage uh, Rasmus into the, co into the conversation. And um, uh, I forgot to mention that actually the, the, the three people behind me uh, are actually calling in from Europe. And it is, uh, it is extremely early in Europe, I believe. And thank you for waking up early and, uh, and, uh, and, and calling in to this, uh, to this session. Um, Rasmus, uh, Travigera launched its, its white paper on the, on the IMOLED shipping decarbonization program um, in, in September 2020. Can you uh, help to elaborate how you experienced the development until now and why it is, uh, it is so crucial um, to put a, a price on carbon in shipping fields? Absolutely. Um, if we go back to September 20 and the immediate six months, we had a lot of uh, skepticism and also criticism even climate ambassadors from leading Scandinavian nations who said publicly that um, it will never happen because in 2013, 2014, IMO proposed market-based measures and it was turned down immediately. The people were making conclusions on something which has been, had been decision-making in the past, which clearly is wrong because the world has changed, society requirements have changed. But we've seen a tremendous mindset change and that has been the biggest fight and it has taken a lot of time speaking or to publicly to move people's mindsets and um, we now come to a situation where not only did Marshall Island make a carbon levy proposal at last prior, last IMO meeting but Japan have just uh, publicized their proposal for market-based measures to be discussed at the next forthcoming IMO meeting. So it's been a tremendous development just in 18 months and that gives hope that we actually can see a, a global carbon price on shipping fuels. And why is this so important? Just to go one step back, Trafigur, 75% of our scope three emissions originate out of shipping. And uh, if the industry doesn't manage to decarbonize, then we will not be able to decarbonize. So there's pressure from everywhere in the feed chain. Uh, but why is it so important? The challenge that we have is that the low and predominantly zero carbon fuels, which is where we definitely need to go, well, they're costing two to three times as much as the fossil fuel. And we see, and we are part of projects, amongst others in Norway, Green Ammonia Project, that when we get to the final investment decision on these projects, there needs to be an offtake. If a bank is, is to give you 80 to 90% leverage uh, financing and even to, to make the project projects realistic for green fuels to be brought to the market, well, then we need someone to offtake them. If there's no market, we cannot realistically expect anyone to offtake in scale. And this is the key. We need green fuels in scale. Well, if there's no market, we cannot expect a large flow of green fuels to hit the market. And if there's not a large flow of green fuels expected to hit the market, well, then we cannot expect owners to go and buy the engine technology. So we need to start at the top level, which is IMO. But IMO is progressing, but we need IMO to take even more responsibility. I believe it's there, it's coming, but IMO member delegates need to understand that it's their responsibility to make this happen. Thank you, Rasmus. Bo, I'm pretty sure that you have an opinion on market-based measures as well. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, thank you. And uh, following up on what uh, Rasmus uh, just said, I think uh, this is this is generally uh, accepted now that to, we see a lot of strong developments, companies leaning in now and getting things going. But in order to really get it to scale at the speed needed, we need uh, regulation and we need global regulation. And this can be done in multiple ways. You could do a pure technical regulation where you just force the carbon content down technically, or you can do it with market-based measures. And I think there's a general understanding also that the market-based way of doing it is probably the better one because then you will do it in a way that sort of fits into to the market and, and in a cost-effective way. So the market will find the cost-effective way. So, so I think uh, that has a tremendous merit. And from uh, the Mass McKinney-Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, we've been working uh, also with different concepts for market-based measures. And uh, I think the proposal that uh, Rasmus was alluding to that was put out by Trafigura is one of those proposals where you collect 
uh, revenue and can spend it in a smart way, both to support the first movers and also to support developing countries and possibly support other things. I think that general principle can actually be used to, to sort of manage uh, the different objectives that we need to see in this transition. Namely that, of course, first of all, we start to uh, transition from, um, from the fossil fuels to the green fuels. And secondly, that um, we do it in a way where developing countries have also a sort of a role to play or a chance to be part uh, of the transition. Um, and finally, in a way, you can say where we're not necessarily just punishing by two or three hundred dollars per ton of CO2, uh, the fossil side, but actually using in a smart way the revenue collected to incentivize and to drive uh, the industry forward. So I think it really has, uh, that has a lot of merit. And the big question now is then how do we get that implemented in IMO? Uh, how do we create the confidence amongst the members of IMO that this is really a good way to get going. So this, I think this is now the trick. And I think fr from my perspective, that there are many different ways that this can be done. Uh, and maybe actually it doesn't really matter which one of the ways we take, honestly. It's much more important that we make a decision and we actually get going. I think also, it's the, I hope the, the negotiations now will sort of be marinated in that mindset that now is really the time to find a solution and perfect could be uh, the enemy of good here. So, so, uh, so that's, that's where we are and uh, we have just in front of us. So this is not long term. The decision pathway is actually very short time. So over, the, I mean, the coming IMO meetings this year and also next year should lead to some very concrete results. This, this, is, this, is, um, this is very, very important. So, so I think this is my short, uh, short answer to your question. Thank you, Bo. Um, let's go back to, uh, to Hamburg, to, uh, to, to Janus. Um, could you uh, share with us what, what are the, the key elements uh, of the Port of Hamburg's decarbonisation strategy and, and what uh, are in that respect the implications for uh, the, uh, the various respective decarbonisation uh, pathways in the maritime industry for you as uh, a port infrastructure provider? Yes, thank you so much and good afternoon to everyone in Singapore. Um, I want to highlight three elements, but just touch on two of those shortly and the other one more elaborate. Um, so the three elements are within our port decarbonization strategy are mobility, of course, the industry and uh, the production of renewables. Of course, we as a landlord port need also to focus on increasing the production of renewable energy. Uh, it goes to wind, to solar, to geothermal but also we need to decarbonize the industry within the port. We not only focus on shipping and uh, shipping technologies, but also the maritime industry within the port, the fixed industry. There we have a major focus on hydrogen. We partner up with several partners around the world, countries that will become hydrogen exporting nations to uh, build an import terminal for hydrogen within the port of Hamburg to use that hydrogen to decarbonize our industry. But of course, also looking at mobility, we have all the different modes of mobility within the port, but of course, mainly shipping. The short-term measure for us is to increase also the shore power supply. We have been the first port in Europe to provide um, onshore power supply for cruise vessels already in 2015. And we will um, extend that supply over the next few years already so that every major berth within the port of Hamburg can have uh, shore power so that we um, aim at a zero emission at birth target in 2030. So that's the short term measures, of course. But then, of course, we have to look what happens to the vessels when they unplug and they go to the open sea. And um, there's, uh, I want to mention, Bose initiative, where we are also part of the European Green Corridor initiative. So uh, that's uh, where we participate in an initiative with other ports. There's where the collaboration is needed, right? Where you need to ensure that the entire value chain for new green fuels is established and uh, to support the rise of those fuels. But then we also look at port and inland vessels. And there we are focusing on developing the fueling infrastructure for basically looking there are three different modes. We're looking at GTL propulsed uh, engines, hydrogen, 
but also electrified uh, vessels for port and inland vessels. And we need to build up the infrastructure for these three um, uh, alternative uh, fueling strategies. And this is also where I come to my last point, maybe what are the challenges for us as a port infrastructure provider? Um, well, basically in the last decades, we had mainly one uh, f fueling uh, element, petrol-based ones. And uh, now we are coming into a phase where we will have several technologies in parallel. And we as an infrastructure provider need to react to that and need to be open so that all these different technologies uh, can um, can be tested in the market. And it's still unclear, of course, what the new silver bullet will be. Will there be ever a silver bullet? But that's, of course, a bigger challenge. It's, I would say, maybe a, to a lesser extent, a big challenge for the large, very large ports, but especially for more crowded ports, for smaller ports, it's a big challenge, of course, to react to the different demands of maybe ammonia, maybe methanol, other green fuels, maybe still LNG, maybe electrification, hydrogen. So to have the infrastructure in place to for bunkering um, and all those kind of things, that's my this, this is a big challenge for the port as a as a landlord. Thank you, Jonas. Um, I would uh, like to go back to, to Erasmus. Um, uh, as there have been uh, calls by, by stakeholders, amongst other the World, World Shipping Council, for uh, full well-to-wake considerations in the, in the assessment of uh, alternative fields, um, could you perhaps elaborate on why such life cycle assessments are, uh, are so important um, compared to the, the current uh, tank-to-propeller propeller approach in the current IMO strategy? Absolutely. Um, without a full life cycle assessment, you don't count all emissions in a fuel. And it, it's one of the challenges with LNG, for instance, because there's a tremendous amount of methane slippage before the LNG hits the tank. And uh, methane over a 20 year time horizon is 86 times more potent. Uh, so we need to be able to compare what is the right emissions that we are emitting in our industry. Uh, for instance, if you look at green methanol and green ammonia, there's a significant uh, and close to zero carbon uh, content predominantly in green ammonia, but also green methanol, as long as it's managed to be captured properly. But without full life cycle assessment, then we're not comparing the right things. But the positive here, IMO is, has come far also in this uh, trajectory. And we do believe and we see uh, that IMO probably and it's not taken for granted, but probably will decide on measuring CO2 emissions on full life cycle assessment, which is a big positive. Just to go back to, and now I jump briefly in terms of uh, IMO and, and carbon frameworks, and I just want to bring in the EU ETS. EU ETS is, in our view, positive in the sense it's pushing IMO. Um, the challenge we have with regional measures and maybe in particular the EU ETS is that the funds collected will go into an, is planned as of today to go into a green innovation fund where there's no warranties that we will see the incentivizing of production of new fuels. And again, we see the biggest obstacle for a, 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 a significant zero decarbonization being around the production and availability of the zero carbon fuels. So the challenge with the EU ETS, and it's just uh, if EU politicians are listening here, uh, well, we need the funds to be channeled back into the industry so we can get the use of zero carbon fuels incentivized. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Um, going back to, to Tilo. Um, Going forward, uh, there is probably going to be uh, uh, more requirement for, for recording and, uh, and keeping, keeping records uh, of, of emissions. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, what, what are the, the prerequisites for a shipping company for a good management of, of uh, the reductions of greenhouse gases, uh, as well as which, which trends do you see going forward uh, using uh, digital, digital tools for this, uh, for this, this decarbonization journey? Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, we heard now from the other panelists um, a lot about the goals and where we want to go to, and also some of the measures we have, including alternative fuels and, and other measure, measures. When it comes to practice, though, um, um, it's very important to know the emissions first uh, and to be able to measure them, and then in the end also to be able to reduce them. And there comes the whole um, reporting. 
um, of the fuel consumption and then also the um, connected emissions into play. And that's the absolute re re prerequisite. Um, we saw this with MLB and DCS. We also see it now with the new CII upcoming next year that there's an extreme need uh, for accurate data in the industry um, about the consumptions of the ships with the different fuels. Uh, and that is the absolute prerequisite that you um, collect very accurate data uh, on your ships and send them to shore to be able to analyze them um, so that you have a sound system in place which can uh, give you a baseline for um, the decarbonization. And that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, historically, this was done and is still done today uh, with a manual ship to shore reporting. This can be very accurate, and this is also what we are doing with a lot of our clients. Um, but we see a trend, because you asked about the trends, um, that more and more automated data reporting also comes into play, so that there are sensors on board of the ships which actually store the fuel consumption on the different engines and equipment and then send them to shore. Um, and we see a pretty strong trend recently in, in the last uh, two to three years that also this data uh, can be used to, to baseline the emissions um, and to uh, have a very reliable uh, reporting. You have to combine it with the manual reporting to be able to uh, judge if it's really uh, good, but this is a trend which is upcoming and in the end will also give us a better baseline for, for the upcoming emission measures. Thank you, thank you, Tilo. Um, going back to, to Bo, um, Bo, your, your center uh, launched its industry transition strategy in October last year. Um, could you perhaps share with us what are the, the targets identified um, in, um, in this strategy and, and how, it is, uh, how its implementation is going at, at the moment? Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, uh, we launched the first version of what we call the industry transition strategy where we are taking a view at the energy system and at the global fleet and from that uh, basically coming up with a proposal to what kind of targets are the right targets for the industry and how are we going to get there. And we launched the first version in October last year and we're working on our next version. And uh, we believe very strongly that uh, the industry can set a target and should set a target of zero in 2050. So that's the first thing, and this is being debated now, and it'll be a part of the conversation in IMO, and, and we're going to support uh, that conversation with deep uh, techno-economic analysis. It's also really important to set uh, markers on 2030 and 2040. In that, as we've heard, IPCC and a lot of others uh, state it's not only the 2050 and we can't l sort of rely on this hockey stick where everything will come together uh, two or three decades from now. So it's also really important and I would say particularly the 2030 mark is really important to focus on. And, uh, and, and for us the 2030 mark it will be important for the energy efficiency uh, efforts, as we just heard uh, Dr. Tilo talking about here. We still believe there's a lot of opportunity in energy efficiency. C uh, CII will drive a part of that, but it will not drive all. So we also need to find the ways of bringing energy efficiency even further. And there are some barriers uh, in our industry due to the way it's segmented between owner and operator and so on. And we have to work with those barriers in a new way using digital tools, etc. So that's one of the allies that is going to be very important for this decade. And then uh, we, need, um, we need to get going. So we need to get these green corridors. You've heard uh, several MOUs today. This is really important. But then the important thing about that is that it's not, there's not much scale in these green corridors actually that we're talking about. The real leverage from the green corridors is when we share the information between the green corridors so that we can really inform and get good standards for the entire industry uh, and get good uh, regulation based on these standards. So I think this is extremely important that we all engage in this and also with a mindset that all these consortia that we see are being set up now have the mindset that Okay, some of this will be proprietary, but a lot of this should actually be made uh, more or less publicly available so that we can learn in the community from each other 
and get the high safety standards, get the high reliability standards, get the real uh, sustainable uh, operations that we're looking for. So I think th these are some of the, the key elements. So yes, it's a long-term vision and a long-term objective, but we have a lot uh, to do uh, right now, actually. And I, I don't need to comment more probably on the regulatory because I see the time is, is running, but, but there's re but yeah, but this is, this is really an important one for the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Um, it, uh, the next question is, is quite, quite uh, general, and, and I would like to ask it to, to, to all panelists, um, um, and probably a very difficult one to, to answer. What, what, uh, what do you see as the biggest obstacle or obstacles for the shipping industry not to embark and progress on, uh, on uh, decarbonization pathways soon or, uh, or fast enough? So, uh, and how can we turn challenges uh, into to opportunities? Can you start, Bernard? Sure. Uh, if I may understand the question, what is the biggest obstacle that we see as owner-operators, right, towards decarbonization? I can't help but also agree with what Bo just mentioned on data. I think the need for big data and understanding of data to be shared across the ecosystems, across partners, right, in the supply chain, will help us to decarbonize further. One, when we talk about the vessels, sensorization of the vessels, sharing of the information allows for better weather routing, optimization, fuel efficiencies on the vessel. You move on to talking about carbon capture, you move on to talk about future fuels, the same. We need to understand the engines and how it works and how operations turn out. And that's where the fuels will be able to better be optimized. So sharing of data is very important and it's not just a digital platform, it is also a human and operational platform that we need to work on. Plus regulatory as well. There's sufficient data that might not be allowed to be shared because of confidentiality. Right. Thank you. Um, Rasmus, uh, talking about obstacles, uh, can, can you uh, add, add anything to this discussion? No, I, I will actually go back to, to, to praise what Bo was saying around the green corridors. Because um, the many small parts makes for a big solution. And we need to have the many small parts put together before the people who can be, who needs to be courageous and take risks. But we need to have the backbone of a start of an infrastructure and the green corridors is part of that. And, and, and yes, I would like to praise Singapore as well for taking more and more leadership on this. And, and this is in Singapore today. So, so well done to MPA for, for pushing these kind of things forward. Um, so the green corridors will be, be a foundation backbone for what is the future. We see I'm just back from North Shipping in Oslo, and that's why I couldn't be, couldn't, cannot be in Singapore physically today. Um, also, a lot of developments around uh, coastal green ammonia bunkering. Uh, and it's all these small aspects that when you put them together, that's when you can really make a big solution globally. And if you combine that with IMO, and, and I think IMO is the biggest obstacle, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but, if, but when we get that solution within IMO and on the back of the green corridors and all of the projects around the world which are mushrooming out, well, then we have the scalability possibility. And that's where we need to be. Thank you, Rasmus. Do you have anything to add? I think, uh, I think the green corridors is a good concept. Uh, I think what it's really about is uh, leadership. And the green corridors are examples of leadership. This is companies and governments leaning in without seeing exactly the business case yet, but they lean in because they feel it's the right thing to do and there's probably some business ahead. So this is really about leadership and, and I think if, if there's an, uh, something I would say point to that we need to see more of, it's more of that. We need to see more of the cargo owners putting out their visions and their objectives for decarbonization. This is a demand signal to the entire uh, supply chain or value chain, meaning that ship owners uh, will also uh, increasingly need to set out real concrete targets, decarbonization trajectories and timelines, meaning that the suppliers, the technologies and the yards and so on, and the fuel suppliers. So when we start to see the whole value chain putting out more concrete objectives and strategies, I think we are one big step further. We're seeing the beginning of that now, and we need to see more of that. Thank you, Bo. Um, 
Since there was a question raised in one of the previous sessions regarding uh, the responsibility of charters, so I, I would like to go back again to, to, to Ras, uh, Rasmus, since Tavigura is one of the largest charters um, uh, around at the moment. Uh, how, how do you see the responsibility of charters um, um, in terms of, of, of the costs of alternative fuels going forward and um, not only put the burden uh, of, of the costs of fuels uh, on, onto the, the owners of the vessels? Okay, thank you for the question. It's a very relevant question. I give you an example. In Norway, we are trying to bring a 270 megawatt green ammonia project to life. We spent two years on pre-feed studies. We have decided to go into feed study with this front-end engineering design study. We are spending together with partners in the project around 20 million euros in something where we don't know if we're gonna have any maturity on the project. We don't know if there will be an off-taker for this. As of today, we don't know if it's going to be ourselves. The problem is there's no market. So what is the responsibility of the charters and the companies with the larger balance sheets? Well, they need to lean out and they need to take certain risks that Bo just talked about. I totally agree with Bo in that sense. But there's only to a certain extent how many money, how much risk capital you can put at stake. But we're putting 20 million euros with our partners at stake to bring this to FID. And FID is the final investment decision. And it's probably 18 to 24 months down the road when we have all the costs and facts locked in the project. And that includes having an off-taker who's willing to pay two to three times the price for a fuel where you don't know if you have a market. So I think that's part of our responsibility to do these things. But again, if we don't have a big framework, and that goes back to, well, how does big companies and charters need to act? Well, I also think they need to go and push regulators hard because that's where the ultimate solution sits. Right, thank you, thank you, Rasmus. Um, I would like to go back to, um, to, to Janus in, in Hamburg. Um, have US Port Authority of Hamburg already identified best practices uh, as landlord of the port and, and, and the assets? to support and initiate uh, concrete decarbonization capabilities and, and associated technologies? Yeah, sure. Um, to answer your question, I would like to uh, shortly go back to your last question. What are the biggest obstacles? And to, to my knowledge, because we are talking with different countries, different uh, potential producers of green ammonia, of green hydrogen and so forth, I think the upscaling uh, of green fuels uh, the, or the pace of the upscaling that is the crucial point and I think the pace of the upscaling is determined mainly by local regulation that's what we're seeing especially in Europe but also in other parts of the world where green ammonia could be produced in southern Africa where we're talking Saudi Arabia but also I, I fear that we see due to the corona pandemic, we have a lot of frictions in the supply chain and that material might be missing that is needed to upscale the production of green fuels. I see that as a big risk, especially. And then of course, the fear that there will be no offtake uh, as, as Rasmus mentioned, right? Uh, but we see that there are several companies that are willing to take the risk. Trafigura is one, we also talk with other bigger ones, um, big, the big, uh, energy producers right now that they are investing in gigawatt projects as well. So I think there is a lot of project going on, but it won't be enough, right? We need several of those initiatives to, to reach the targets. And that's where I come to my point where I think is best practice. It's also what um, Bernard mentioned. It is we need a new um, approach to these projects and it's a more cooperative approach and a truly cooperative approach because uh, there's a lot of risk in the, in the business, there's a lot of uncertainty. And that's also we as a landlord have to be more flexible, more cooperative in, in our lease agreements as well, right? Uh, land needs to be provided much more quicker and also much more short term. And we need a more a, a testing field within the port to test these new technologies and provide a living playing field for those to, to mature and to develop. So real cooperation. That is what I want to highlight here to, to bridge that or uh, to, to increase the pace of, of upscaling green fuels. Thank you. Thank you, Janus. Um, we have a few minutes left and um, 
It is probably typical after lunch. There is only one question in uh, in um, in the pigeonhole uh, box. I, I, I will read it to you, and and whoever wants in the panel wants to pick up uh, pick up the question by 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 all means. It says the the technology to produce nature-based drop-in biofuels is available, thus reducing uh, ca uh, carbonization. But why is it not accelerated? I can I can try and share um, some opinions here. It's not fully data driven, but there are some concerns with respect to biofuels that I think we might want to address. One is the actual carbon emissions reduction is said to be zero carbon because of the life cycle of the fuel or the plant itself. But if that plantation has also done done some carbon offsets and credit system, then that credit has already been taken off. So biofuel in itself, when you burn it, combusted, there is still CO2. So that is a technical fact, right? That we have been understanding. But then you look next into the infrastructure. How consistent and how regular a fuel supply will you have? How does this affect the operations of the engine, of the vessel performance? How does it blend if you're using this as a blended fuel? These are all engineering and operational questions that have to be addressed consistently. You can't just have biofuel in one port and the next port you change back to your MGO and so on. I think these are some of the considerations. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, I thought you were going some, to add something, but <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I, I would actually, f for the last question, go, going back, back to, to basics, and, and um, a number of times during this event, uh, low-hanging fruits were already mentioned. Uh, going back to energy, looking into uh, ship designs, basics, and energy efficiency, optimized propulsion, uh, carefully considering uh, operational profile, which may have a mismatch, mismatch with, uh, with the actual operation of, of, of the vessel. Um, on... Um, on Monday, I learned about that, that we are born in the same year, so we are probably in the industry uh, uh, for about the same time. But w when I recall uh, how ships look like uh, 20, 30 years ago, they still look, look the same. Uh, there have been very little incentives and there have been very little appetite for, uh, for ship owners to, uh, to evolve the ship designs. So how do we get... Um, actually ships more uh, energy efficient going forward since since these are supposed to be low hanging fruits i think um, if 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 you look back at the last 20 years we've actually seen a rather tremendous developments in technology so me coming from the container shipping side we've i mean gone up when i was a student a big ship was <laughs> like 3000 tu and now it's almost 10 times uh, larger it's, uh, it's the efficiency has been going down a lot, and I think we've been telling ourselves that we're doing really well, and I've certainly been bragging about all the good stuff that I've been involved in. Uh, the thing is just that the emissions from shipping have continued to go up. So, uh, so we just have to realize that, and that's really how to, how to break the curve. So, so how do we get the energy efficiency out as low-hanging fruits? I think there's a, a, a quite a bit that can be done by the business, the market itself, but it, it won't happen. We've seen that. There's a lot of potential that does, just doesn't happen. And it's due to different time perspectives and due to ownership and operator structures and so on. So there is a role here for, um, for policy or for regulation and standards. And I believe, for example, at the CII, when we have the review of the CII, now these years we have to learn uh, how it works and so on, but then when it comes to 2026 and beyond, uh, we really have to use this uh, instrument to, to get CII going. And it means, and I think it particularly means that in the large part of the shipping industry where you don't have uh, integrated owners and operators, we need to find a way of breaking uh, that knot so that it becomes a very good idea to own a ship with extremely good energy efficiency because it's reflected in the charter rates. It's reflected in the contract, and the contract is probably modern and using digital technology and so on and so forth. So I think there are some big opportunities that are right in front of us, and it's doable. Right. Thank you, Bo. Um, we're almost two minutes over time now, so I'll... Um
on that note, I will, I will close this session. Um, we may not have been able all your decarbonization concerns, but uh, we hope that we have given a little contribution to the, to the discussion to, uh, to help us moving, uh, uh, going into the direction. So thank you to the people in Hamburg and in Norway uh, and to Bo and, uh, and to you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists and our moderator. Thank you. Big hand for them. Thank you. I'd like to invite you back to your seats and a reminder to place your mask. Thank you.